Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Hone and Izzy Lawrence. It's our fourth anniversary, so for this special episode, we're having an anniversary Q&A special live at the old fire station in Oxford. Don't worry about the audio quality, it gets a lot better. Ladies and gentlemen, to come on anyway because it is one minute past three and I know our audience and our audience <laughs> will start twitching you know no offence to you guys I, I, I mean personally I love to wind up pedantic people one because it's easy and three <laughs> so thank you so much for coming I'm, I'm going to do this as a sort of start if you don't know why you're here if you're with somebody <laughs> you, you might want to leave now yeah um, if you want to walk out we, we'll take it well um, but no we, we do a podcast called Terrible lizards. Terrible, yeah, exactly. It was, oh, it was on the screen. It oh. was on the screen. It's right, gone so. now, but that's fine. It's, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Boom. Yay. Um, oh, by the way, photography is allowed because, you know, I'm assuming that you want to take No one wants a photo. I don't want a photo. <laughs> but but the, idea, the idea being um, that um, it was 2020, a week from today, that Dave and I believe released the last, the first, first. of our ep- first episode. So we're, we're basically out right now when the trailer was out. So this is like for our first thing, because what happened was, this is all thanks to it. Does anybody listen to The Rest is History? One person, two people. Two, two, people, two people like humans as well as animals. So we got... <laughs> That's more than I thought. Exactly. Really, really well done to you guys. Um, the Rest of History is presented by a man called Tom Holland who writes amazing books. Uh, Rubicon, I think, is one of the best history books out there. And um, I am a friend of his... Because he likes nerds, right? He likes nerds and cricketers mainly, and also paleontologists. And I arrived at one of his Christmas parties, having well, already been to the pub. You've been there a while, judging by the state of it. Yeah. Also, Tom Holland has teenage daughters who mix drinks a lot like teenagers do, thinking that a gin and tonic is 50 50. <laughs> and I'd had a couple of these before Tom walked me through to the kitchen, where we all like to hang out at parties. And in His kitchen's about the size of this room. Though, it is. It's amazing. Anyway, <laughs> and, 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 I will, and I and I get introduced to this no, man. No, 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 no. What happened was... Who, uh, who was sober? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I went up to you. You always tell this story wrong. OK. I know, bickering like a couple. We've All heard right. it before. But yes, you, you were at Bristol, I said. I said, yeah, I, I was at Bristol, thinking, how, how on earth did he know that? And when he says I was at Bristol, um, to any Americans, that means I was at Bristol University. It isn't a, some sort of euphemism for us, a strip club or something like that. Um, <laughs> it was, I, no, it wasn't. That was, that was, that's a different use of the word Bristols. Anyway, and I said, yeah, I was at Bristol. It's nice to meet you. And you said... I can't remember what I said. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what you said. Yes, yes. No, we do know each other. We used to live together. <laughs> <laughs> Which is technically true. Yes. Because uh, student were... accommodations, there was about 100 people in the building, but. I had been in his bedroom to check out his wit scorpion. So... And, and normal scorpions. And normal scorpions. Yeah, but yeah. the wit scorpion, if you've not seen one before, it will freak you out. Google it now yeah. for listening. <laughs> so we basically met up like in 2019 at a Christmas party and thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could do a podcast or something like that? Because, you know, we, we get on and that sort of thing. And then the world ended. And we, we thought, had some free time. And we had some free time. Well, you, didn't, you didn't have any gigs, and I was stuck at home. So. This is it. This is it. And so we thought, what? Well, what? Well, why not? And four years later, this is why not. So <laughs> you get to suffer for it yes. and for being here. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do, we do these question episodes. So if you have questions about dinosaurs, please do bring them because he knows a lot about dinosaurs. 
I don't know if any of you were into mm-hmm. dinosaurs. I've been, I've been counting the dinosaur T-shirts from people coming in. Exactly. So <laughs> if, you, if you have a question, if not, I can go to the emergency question, so we're all right. Look, we've already got, so we've got two, <laughs> two three, here. Four, three, yeah, four, yeah. Five, fantastic. Right. Great, guys. That, that'll fill 90 minutes, so the rest there, of there you don't need to worry too so, much. So, gentlemen here mm-hmm. in the red T-shirt, oh, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Yeah, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Uh, not dinosaurs, technically, but we approve. Uh, what's your name, sir? They're getting on. Paul, by the way, um, Paul, you're going to find this because we're recording this and I don't know if the thing's going to pick you up or not. I'm going to repeat, like a computer, everything you say. How do we know that no dinosaurs had external ears? How do we know that no dinosaurs had external ears, Dave? At one level, technically, we don't. (laughs) So, yes, because it's almost impossible to prove a negative that we don't know. But the other thing is no reptile does at all. So this is one of those phylogenetic information things like you know you look at the living species and no birds have external ears yes they've cheated their feathers in a few places but they haven't done anything with the skin at all and then absolutely no reptile has so of course it's not impossible that they did and one of them somewhere evolved something weird but it would be very very odd if none of 10,000 species of bird and none of 8,000 species of lizard had managed it but dinosaurs did and we do at least have a handful that are preserved well enough with all the skin and everything else and you can see there's nothing there and if it was at least common we'd probably have found it by now so do we 100 percent know no but i'm 99.99 i i'd put a good lump of money <laughs> on dinosaurs not having little rat like or let alone rabbit like ears stuck on the outside cool though it might be i think it's to do with the fact that it's the joke is do you think he saw us or do you think he heard us <laughs> and that's that's important. Wow, we're going, we're going that low this soon. Shut aren't we? up. <laughs> this, this will be a very long 90 minutes idiocy. if I shut up. <laughs> so, uh, how about we go next to Paul? What is your name? We met in the streets. We met. Uh, this, this thing, uh, we, were, we were being cool because we were walking in the wrong direction from the venue and you picked us up on that already. So, you're, you better be going the other way. I bought my t shirts. What's, what's your name? Chris. Chris. Lovely to meet you, Chris. And what is your question? I would like to ask, given that we know a little bit of about dinosaurs' intelligence, or at least have kind of an idea. Do you think they played, that they engaged in play behaviour? So that is a question asking... Dinosaurs, we know a bit about their intelligence, but do they engage in play? My guess is probably, or at least some of them would, and that's not quite the same answer I just gave in terms of phylogenetic inference, but in terms of looking at what we know living animals are capable of. And play is one of those weird things which is kind of hard to describe and define, but you also kind of know it when you see it. And I think that's... I, I don't know the science of that side very well, but... Certainly I've seen lots of animals do things which it's hard to consider as anything other than play. And behaviourists and ethologists who have really studied this are very happy that this is present in all kinds of mammals, obviously. It's present in all kinds of birds, but it actually turns up in some lizards as well. The bigger and smarter lizards like iguanas and some of the monitor lizards and things like this and teguins and some other stuff. But again, if you start looking at things like brain capacity and intelligence... It's all very, very vague and very, very woolly, but on balance, dinosaurs are at least as intelligent as your average reptile and probably a little bit better. So if those reptiles are capable of this, you would expect dinosaurs to be capable of this. And I I guess going back to the ears one almost as well, you know, the one thing I try and say increasingly is we, we need to be very careful when we say dinosaurs did or dinosaurs didn't or dinosaurs were. We know of maybe 1500 species or so but the reality was probably more like i wouldn't want to guess 20,000 species 100,000 species across their evolutionary history across 150 million years on all seven continents and everything from mountains like the idea that one of them didn't do it you know there is always what you know there is you know this is but this is a you know this is a, you know birds fly apart from all the ones that don't you know all mammals swim apart from the couple that can't you know there is always almost always an exception somewhere and when you've got that level of diversity over that period of time in that many different places yeah i'm sure there was one that did everything we just said that they didn't but again my best guess is dinosaurs were as smart or smarter than your average lizard and we know plenty of them are capable of this behaviour. I would be surprised if they weren't capable of that behaviour. I'm sure some of them did it, bordering perhaps on many and most. There we go. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Given their size, 
Um, why aren't we finding lots of flightless pterosaurs? Oh, good question. Got, wait, 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 wait. Oh, I've got to repeat it. That was Matt, wasn't it? Matt. Matt, yes. Matt's asking, given their size, why weren't there many flightless pterosaurs? I have one, Jill. Um, <laughs> do, doing a very good job. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so this is something I, I hinted at in my last book because it was technically about dinosaurs and didn't really get to write about pterosaurs, uh, but it's part of the same general issue. Where you find flightless birds mostly is on islands. And where you find isolated islands mostly is because they're volcanic. And that's about the worst possible place to get a fossil. Volcanic islands are generally very short-lived. They form very quickly, but they're in a massive volcanic growth. They have a nasty tendency of just exploding and disappearing and vanishing again really very, very quickly. And even if they don't and they do persist, they formed literally because they're on a continental a meeting of continental plates. They are inevitably going to be subducted. So first of all, they're not going to be around very long. You know, they're just going to be destroyed. They're not going to hang around for 60, 100 million years for us to go looking there. And even if you did, you look at places like Hawaii and the Galapagos, and it's basically bare rock. You don't have nice lakes and s- slow-moving water and lots of silt and all the kind of things you need to bury something. So I am very confident there were huge numbers of flightless pterosaurs on islands all over the world. I be amazed if we ever find them because they're the worst possible places that fossils won't form and even if they did they'd get subducted so the, the the kind of ones you might expect is something like hats egg so if you know hats egg so this is the what is now transylvania eastern europe and 70 um, ish million years ago was basically an archipelago of uh, you know a nice tropical mediterranean like sea And, yeah, we have some of the biggest pterosaurs ever are from those islands, and they appear to be basically the dominant terrestrial carnivores. That's exactly the kind of place you might expect one of them to turn into a flightless animal, and it's at least possible we'll find a flightless pterosaur there. But island chains generally don't form... You know, volcanics particularly badly, but island chains in general are not great at forming fossils. So I, I hold out a hope that something will turn up in Hungary that kind of region, um, Bulgaria, but I'm not very confident. But I am confident there were flightless pterosaurs because we flightlessness just evolves at the drop of a hat. Flight is so incredibly expensive energetically that if you don't have to fly, you kind of want to get rid of it if you can. And so it's amazing just how many different bird lineages have dropped it and just how quickly they've dropped it. It happens very, very fast. It looks like you know things arrive and then within a few hundred thousand years, they've like, nah, ditched it. And ditched it quite dramatically, not just like can't fly, like the wings have massively reduced and the sternum's reduced and the muscles. All of this stuff has gone. So I'm sure that pterosaurs appearing on the Jurassic equivalent of Hawaii or the Galapagos or New Zealand were absolutely flightless. But whether or not we'll ever find them, I wouldn't put any money on that, unfortunately. What's that name of that? Because there's a weird sort of bird slash dinosaur thing that goes with B. Oh, Belur. Belur, that's it. I remember Belur. We did a very yeah, so early Belur might be a weird flightless bird. Okay, but it's an early one. So, but, well, Belur was described as a weird dromaeosaur, so Velociraptor-like thing, with a double sickle claw on its foot, which already is very, very coarse. Cool, so it's got two, not one. And then a later analysis said, actually, it probably sits the other side of the bird split, and so it actually might be a giant, weird, predatory, flightless bird. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. That, so again, you know, dropping flightness. I mean, and even birds in the Mesozoic drop flightlessness. They're Hesperornithiforms and things like this. Hesperornithiforms? Yes. You so um, let's call the whole thing up. Um, but, yeah, no, there are... Yeah, but, but flight loss is really, really common. I'm sure pterosaurs were flightless. I don't think we'll find flightless pterosaurs. Sadly, because that would be very, very... But they should have thicker bones and stuff, at least. Potentially, yes. Uh, what, what I'd really expect is to see the wing finger reduced. That would be the real obvious feature. Yeah. They just Because they're still quadrupedal, but they just don't need the, the flight membrane. So that, yeah, they're giant ring finger. It's their giant little finger. Ring finger, ring finger. Ring finger. I'd, I'd expect that to just disappear overnight, basically. Okay. Imagine a wedding of pterosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yes, we have we have somebody here. What's your name? Jane. Excellent, Jane. What's your question? Just coming off that. Yeah. So, if birds reduce their wings, it's not a big deal because they're only using the flight. Pterosaurs walk on their wings. So, pterosaurs? Sorry, pterosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're walking on their wings. So, what we imagine if they were to become flightless, that would mean they'd just, you'd lose the skin. They'd be like hideous giraffe creatures. So, 
So what Jamie wants to know is what would a flightless uh, pterosaur look like? Because, you know, obviously they're walking on their wings. So how, how would that yeah. work? So, yeah, so that's why I said wing finger, because, yeah, the whole proximal forelimbs of the humus radius ulna and they have these giant metacarpals in the hand is all part of the walking apparatus. Um, but it's the finger in particular, which when they're walking normally sticks up and backwards. So that's what's... You just, you just don't need it. It's just getting in the way at this point. And then, yeah, I'd expect the wing membrane to just basically vanish very, very quickly. Again, flightless birds reduce not just the wings, but they reduce the feathering on them. Uh, and so massively reduce, you know, kiwis being the best example. Yeah, they really got rid of them. But, you know, things like cassowaries and stuff like this. Cassowaries have sizable arms, but they're very few feathers on them. So, you know, any kind of cost you, you try and ditch. So, yeah, growing that membrane... Yeah, there's absolutely no need for it at all. So, yes, I would expect them to be really quite leggy, spindly animals. I mean, anyone... I bet there's one person in the room. So, Dougal Dixon's After Man book? Yeah, yeah. Hey, there we go. <laughs> so, Dougal Dixon, very prolific writer of dinosaur books and other things. We did some, like, futurism evolution books, one of which he had flightless bats. So, he had a chain of islands where the bats got there before the birds and then you had flightless bats. And yeah, it, th- that's what they're going to look like. I mean, vampires already. Someone seen the video of vampires running on a treadmill? If you haven't seen, you want to watch the videos yeah. of vampires running on a treadmill. This, these are um, vampire bats. This is not Christopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, already, you know, those membranes are so elastic, you barely see them as it is. If it wasn't that you knew that bats are weird little things, you would think it was some kind of long leg rat running along. That's what a running bat looks like. So yeah, pterosaur would be the same. And, and again, the, the most obvious thing, so you know, Hatsa, Hatsagopteryx, um, these are the Ashdarkids, so these are the really, really big, you know, 10 metre wingspan, late Cretaceous ones that are literally giraffe sized. But they're unusual, actually, and they have very, very long first part of the arm, and the wing finger itself is actually very, very short. So actually, there's not too much to get rid of there as well. So again, it wouldn't change their external appearance that much lose the wing finger lose the membranes and other than that they don't need to change very much but what would we call them Dave because we can call them flappy flaps so. <laughs> we, we don't call them that now oh. you may call them that, <laughs> which is rather different yeah this is <laughs> what we do okay another question yes what's your name sorry Rosie Rosie I'm really confused about the common ancestor before the split to pre-split and then there you go, read that out. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I get you, Rosie. So Rosie wants to know, like, the split between prosauropods and... So saurisians and ornithisians, Yeah, think, really. sort of the whole hip thing, you know. Yeah. What, 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 what's that all about, then? So, yeah, basically, I, I will attempt. The ancestral dinosaur, uh, as far as we know what it is, is something that would actually look a lot like a small theropod. All of the dinosaur morphs and dinosaur forms and lagopatids and all these other weird little things around the origin of dinosaurs all look pretty much the same which is a meter or so long half of which is tail standing on their back legs with relatively long front limbs with four or five fingers on them and a relatively long thin neck and a small head with lots of sharp teeth it looks like a small theropod that is basically everything that was knocking around there and so that really is your origin and then to be honest as usual with these things you know when dinosaurs were first named they were really distinct and obviously distinct and then the more and more and more stuff we find the more that goes from black and white into all these different shades of gray and therefore actually really the evolutionarily and anatomically the difference between those and a true theropod is blurred to the point that we have things like herrerasaurus this one from argentina that has come up as an early theropod or just outside theropods or maybe linked to the sauropods or maybe outside because we don't know because it's all blurred and it's it's hard to say so if you have that in your head that that really is what the earliest dinosaurs were like and the sauropodomorphs i mean the earliest sauropodomorph so we've got a thing called um i was going to call it it's not the eoraptor um panphagia and that looks pretty much the same but it's got just enough features that it kind of trips over the line but you wind forward another five or six million years and suddenly you've got a bigger body with a longer neck and a smaller head and more rounded teeth and you're starting to get something that looks like a prosauropod like Pladiosaurus or something like that and on the theropod side they just basically get bigger and toothier and then on the ornithisian side we don't really know what's going on because we still don't have any Triassic ornithisians we have a bunch of maybes but we really don't have anything 
definitive. And so by the time, a bit like the pterosaur problem, by the time you get your first true ornithician, it's got all the weird ornithician features. Its pelvis has changed, its hands have changed, its teeth has changed, it's got this extra bone in the, to form the beak, it's got these extra bones in the skull over the eyes. But again, he still kind of looks like a little theropod, to be quite honest. They're all the same. <laughs> all the same. No one knows. No one cares. <laughs> this, is, so this, is what you, I was say, this is what you get when you do it in secret because we're going to yeah. broadcast this. Yeah, so so I'm, giving the, I'm giving the game away. Dave um, doesn't you, know. You can, no, tell, no. you can tell I don't work on Triassic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they, they are all very, very similar in the same way. Again, when you look at the human origin stuff and the difference between all the different Australopithecines, they all look the same. Yes, you know, of course they are actually different and the experts are pulling that stuff out. But yeah, there's a reason why when you just take the first look at them, that there's not a lot going on. So I hope that vaguely helps. <laughs> Does that help for Rosie? Are you a bit happy? A bit, a bit. Uh, chap here, what's your name? Tom. Tom. What do we know about the origins of pterosaurs? Um, do we know a lot? Actually, are there archosaurs as well? Yeah. So hang, on, it, hang on, I've got uh, my job. Yeah. Sorry, I was well, I'm here. <laughs> So we know a little bit now about the origins of Ornithisians and Sarissians, but what about pterosaurs, Dave? That's from Tom. Yeah, so, so I mean, pterosaur origins were the subjects of my PhD thesis, and the answer at the end of that was about the answer that it was at the start, which is probably archosaurs, probably close to dinosaurs after that, not sure. But yeah, it really has firmed up in the last four or five years, because, yeah, the, the long-suspected closest things to them so this group called Lagopatids and some others which again are knocking around in this just before the true dinosaurs appear period Lagopatids have been identified as being probably the closest thing to pterosaurs was probably as early as 96 but it all hinged around this really weird thing from Scotland called Scleromoculus and the problem with Scleromoculus is it's small it's appallingly preserved to the point that it's, it's actually a block of rock with holes in it so the holes are where the bones used to be, but we don't actually have the bones. So we've got the inverse, which you can then make a mould of it to get the bones out, except the rock that it's in is really, really, really coarse-grained. So it looks horrible. And, you know, the bones are a couple of centimetres long, and then made with, like, coarse sand grains. So, of course, you've just sort of got the vague shape of some of them. But what features you could get out of it really were quite close to what we thought the earliest pterosaurs might look like, and it linked them to dinosaurs. Um, but yeah, in the last 10, 15 years, we found southern US, so New Mexico, and those kind of areas, and then Argentina, and I think up towards places like Ecuador. We've now found a ton of these things, and we've got some relatively good skeletons. Like, most of the skeleton and the actual bone are not a hole where the bone might have been at some point before it was squidged. And when you start processing those anatomical details... They come out very close to pterosaurs indeed. So basically, you've got a couple of odd branches of things very, very close to the origin of dinosaurs, and the pterosaurs popped out of one of them. So pterosaurs are, among big groups that people have heard of, pterosaurs are basically the nearest thing to dinosaurs. But there's some other rubbish in there. Hmm. The fossils you described are also Triassic. Yeah, the, the fossils you described. <laughs> I, mean, I, can, I can do that. Also Triassic. Yeah, so the, these are these are all late Triassic. Okay. The pterosaur origins probably go back to the middle Triassic. So these are late surviving versions, but in the same way that platypus are still around now, even though their ancestors were go a lot further than go to go, will go to the early Cretaceous at least. They're still close enough that we can tie them in. After that, it's, in terms of pterosaur origins, it still becomes less clear because the problem you still have with animals like the Lagopatids and their closest relatives is they're still fundamentally terrestrial and they're still probably more bipedal than quadrupedal. And, the, and, and pterosaurs are all quadrupedal and were almost certainly climbing in trees before they started flying. So it's kind of the equivalent of having almost like a, a kangaroo rat or something like that, and going, well, this is the closest thing to bats. Well, great, but at what point did it stop running around on its back legs and start climbing up the trees on all fours? Because that's a pretty big evolutionarily and ecolog ecological shift. And <laughs> is, the, is the answer to that. Who, who the hell knows? And it's one of those... That, that's another thing that like, we'll probably never find. Like, you know, the, the real... I've, I've written about this before. You know, we have archaeopteryx. You know, we have all these transitional birds... But they're, they're pretty different in a way. So for a start, they're 100 million years more recent. 
So there's 100 million years less time for them to have been lost. Um, but for the pterosaurs, they're so much smaller, their so, bones are so much thinner, and we're probably looking for stuff that was in a forest, which, again, is like the worst possible place to make fossils. So we're looking for something very, very small, very, very fragile, very, very old, that was probably in very small numbers in a place that didn't form fossils very well. So I don't hold out a lot of hope for finding an Archaeopteryx equivalent with half a long finger but not a full finger and gripping hands and feet but not yet true climbing hands and feet or whatever else it is. Um, I, I don't think that's ever going to turn up. It probably never fossilised. But there's always hope. There, there is. There's always hope. But basically no. <laughs> I, I like to think. I, I'd like to think somebody in this room is going to do a PhD and prove you wrong. There you go. Uh, as long as they cite me. <laughs> Lady over here. What's uh, Diane? Diane, what's your question? I've been watching magpies hop around, and <gasps> I wondered if dinosaurs ever did. I want to imagine I'm going for kangaroo. That's amazing. Yeah. So do dinosaurs hop, Dave? That um, is. Like a magpie as well. Did they hop? I mean, as a, as a fundamental form of locomotion, I don't think they did, which is annoying, because I, I remember when I was doing my master's writing some notes about possibility of hopping because I thought it would be quite likely for some of the smallest ones. Anatomically, it would be very hard to tell a hopper from a walker. And again, even things like magpies kind of shift between the two. And then you've got things like um, vultures have a form of locomotion called a half-bound. So they do two quick steps, then a big one, then two quick, then a big one. Skipping. Um, Why don't they call that skipping? That's exactly what skipping is. Half bound. Skipping. It's totally good. Skipping the bush vulture. That's anyway, <laughs> that's, that's a very different show. The reason I that they did is simply because we do have loads and loads and loads of tracks of small dinosaurs and birds. And I've never seen, because of course they'll, they'll leave very distinctive parallel pairs of tracks. And I've never seen one or ever heard of one. So I simply don't think they did. It is a form of locomotion which, if I remember my biomechanics right from my undergraduate days, it is more efficient at small sizes. I know kangaroos do it a lot, and kangaroos are weird in that regard because very few big animals bound or half bound. Um, <laughs> for, for those of you listening, I pulled a face face at Izzy. I'm a chuggle laugh. Great. Um, not the only comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I make the podcast better. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> well, well, you make it because I don't do anything. I just, I just talk and then you do all the editing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if things like alvarosaurs did it. So these really, really tiny ant-eating dinosaurs or, or, or small insect-eating dinosaurs. I've written a paper about that with colleagues. They appear to have an unusually efficient form of locomotion and bounding can be very efficient so they're at least a possibility but unfortunately again they're hanging around in deserts not a great place to leave footprints because you want them in mud so i wouldn't be amazed if they did but i don't think we'll be able to show it i remember the alpha and the saw because that's the one with the bouncy toe it's got a, a weirdly springy toe well they, yeah they've got the octometatarsalian condition so they've got the weirdly squidged middle bone of the middle of the foot which tyrannosaurs also have and so do truodontids and so do some oviraptorosaurs which basically stops the bones in the foot moving when you put the foot down and that transmits more force through the joint into the tendon so that you recover that energy on the next step so it's efficiency bouncy yes that's that's what we like <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, gentlemen in the strike top uh, James Nice to meet you, James. What's your question? Bone histology. Uh, several papers take slices out of bones. What happens when the paper's done? Can you reuse it? Can you reuse the slice, or do they get given away as novelty coasters? So, <laughs> James would like to know if you can still like use bones after you've sliced them for your research, or are they just sold as coasters? Curious enough, we do reuse them. I mean, what, what happens is basically they're usually just stored in the museum, so you, you'll get anyone who might have done you know high school biology you get those lovely trays of all the little slides all the little things on you get them of histological sections because they're usually mounted in some kind of resin anyway when you polish them down so you can store them and if they're small enough you'd actually mount them in a slide anyway quite literally so i've, I've seen slide decks of thin sections of bones but they are they are literally your data and of course the replica replicability of science or at least the attempted replica replicability um means that you know yeah if someone says well i think you've measured that wrong 
you don't want to have given it away or sold it in the gift shop. Uh, you, you, I mean, you might if you're trying to cover up your data. It's an excellent excuse of, well, yeah, well trust me, all my numbers are right, but I, I'm afraid it's now being used as a coaster in the uh, office. It's a good way of obscuring that you've uh, fabricated your data, which is why you're not supposed to do it. At least a few specimen catalogues online if you look. So the Natural History Museum, as in the London NHM, they, most of their specimens are now online. And if you search for histological specimens, you can even see photos of these slides, they'll still be kept and archived. What's your name? Victoria. Victoria. What's your question, Victoria? Um, in January, I learned that different doses of teeth weren't designed for stripping branches, <gasps> which was a surprise. So has that changed fundamentally how we understand the effect? So do they eat more like geese, eating softer teeth, like plants and ferns, or something in the middle? So Victoria is ruining my absolute dream of how um, diplodocus eat. A stripping diplodocus. A stripping diplodocus, yeah. <laughs> well, I always imagine them, because they've got slightly pointed out teeth, so the teeth sort of like sort of go in more like a, they sort of stick out, you know, a bit, a bit like a posh English lady. Very cumbered. Hi. All right. We're in Oxford, it works. We know what we mean. Right. So, and the way I would imagine them eating would be by stripping branches, which is like me eating a Solero ice cream. I'm going to stick hot in one and then like that. That's, that's how I imagine meeting. Is that wrong? Uh, well, so that description is a pretty good description of the work of Paul Barrett and Paul Upchurch, which I think they published yes. in 2001-ish, something like that, years and years and years ago. And I think that's generally been the accepted position. This isn't an area I'm very good at. Um, and my new book, ah, plug, uh, that's coming out in November, um, I wrote a chunk about this and I sent it to a sauropod expert to go over it because I wasn't very confident in it. He went, no, 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 that's all wrong. And I went, well, I'm not sure I got all the details right, but I think it was all wrong and went back and read a whole bunch of other papers. And what you inevitably found is, yes, there's been a bit of a back and forth over this stripping or not stripping argument for Diplodocus. And it went one way and then it went the other way and then it went back the other way and then it kind of middled around. I still think it's a decent hypothesis. I know the paper or work you're referring to, though I, I can't remember who published it, but I was at the Natural History Museum conference in January where the author of that paper presented this, and Paul Barrett was in the front row and gave him a bit of a grilling <laughs> and <laughs> did the, yeah, you say that, but that's not what we said in our paper, and how do you account for this? And then John Whitlock, I think, had a paper about 2012 where he was quite dismissive of it, but I don't think any of them have really dealt with the issue that Paul and Paul originally came up with, which is you've basically got the wear on the back of the teeth. And for anything that's doing a kind of normal biting or cropping or chewing... How do you wear the teeth on the inside and not on the outside unless you are doing something like this? I hate these kind of magic bullet answers in paleontology because you, you keep getting lots of this. Oh, I found this feature, therefore they did that. And I think the vast majority of time those are badly overstated or misunderstood. But this is one where this is a very, very obvious and clear feature of the wear of the teeth in diplodocids. And as, as you said, they've got these very front sticking out teeth, which is odd. And that's a very odd thing to do if you're trying to crop normally because it's pushing the force in the wrong direction. So you do need an explanation for why they have this very distinctive jaw shape and very distinctive wear patterns. And none of the people who said it's not branch stripping have got an explanation for it. I think this is the first time you've done an answer like this where we don't know the real feature of something and you haven't mentioned sexual selection. Because it, it probably isn't. Well, it might be. You know, why not? OK. Anyway. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that easy being a pain in the tonic. Just, yes. Um, there's a thing I knew about that Sora had come out recently, and I've heard people say that those little eyes are the teeth that they have that are missing from the mobility that they have that could be used for display and it was shown in a prehistoric planet but that doesn't seem possible <laughs> we've got we've got an belly sore we've got a belly sore what's your question yeah what was her name so sorry, sorry. Name. what's your bit no, what's your question name uh i mean yeah thank you uh so it's hard my job okay so i have to remember all of these things for seconds so i mean yeah, I, mean, I, know, I just have to recount to already in the research Best dinosaurs, which are belly sores, because they're called belly sores, and they've got these little arms. Now, on prehistoric planets, we've seen how they yeah, were, you know, used yeah. for display. 
Amelia thinks that's nonsense. So I, I, I'm in your camp. Uh, this is, I know this is. I know Darren Nash does listen occasionally, and Darren, if you don't know, was the lead consultant on Prehistoric Planet. I know he was one of the people who came up with this, or at least I think he was involved with it. Um, so if you're listening, Darren, sorry, but I don't buy it. Um, <laughs> and, the, and the reason I don't buy it is so. I think Darren's argument was they are... The, so the shoulder structure is unusual. They do appear to be very, very highly mobile. So, yeah, but they really do appear to be like almost like a ball and socket, complete free yeah. joint for this They're little They're much arm. smaller than a T-Rex arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it's, it's not so much that I... I it, it, there are, oh, let's start that again. Edit. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that they couldn't be for display, but they're certainly not a classic display feature because display features are there or, or are selected for for one of two basic reasons, is that either they're an, what we call an honest signal because they're a handicap, so, you know, peacocks, tails, and lions, manes, and things like this. You, you are doing something, and you can't cheat it. You, you can't grow bigger and brighter tails if you're not healthy enough to grow a bigger and brighter tail. So the guy who's got the biggest and brightest tail has got enough energy and is healthy enough and doesn't have any disease and the best genes and can grow that. So that's one. And the other one we think of is what's called runaway selection, where something is selected for because the other sex actually just likes it randomly. That definitely does turn up. Um, sword tails, anyone keeps small tropical fish? A couple of people nodding. Excellent. So sword tails are these little things from the Amazon, and they have a little spike on the tail, and they're very close related to another group called mollies. And if you show a female molly a sword tail, she thinks this is the sexiest thing she's ever seen. And yet mollies have never evolved it, so it does just appear to be... If you get the right kind of novelty, there happens to be a random bit of fizzing in the brain that just likes that thing, and therefore it will just spread. And those are the two ways which we think sexual selection and display features generally operate. And it's not obvious how this fits either of them, because, yeah, if you were trying to grow the biggest, best display arm, you'd grow a massive arm. You wouldn't grow a tiny little one. And equally, if this was something that females really loved and really went for, or males really loved and really went for, generally the bigger one is a better one. So you'd want a bigger and bigger arm. And these arms are absolutely tiny. So if, if these, and these belly soles were around for a good, you know, 40, 50 million years, if this was something that was regularly being selected for, you would expect it might be an incredibly weird arm. It might be a giant, long, spindly thing and end up looking like a pterosaur finger. But you'd expect it to look like that. So just being a tiny arm that spins round a bit, I can imagine that is something that is part of their display. So in that respect, I think it's perfectly reasonable that that's something the arm did and a function that it held. But is that the reason it has evolved that degree of flexibility and why it was retained and why it didn't change size and shape? That I, I can't see. Yes, at the back. What's your name? Mike. Mike. So oh. earlier this year we had uh, the Macriensis. Uh, yes. And then you've got the year before T. Imperator and T. Regina. Yes. Yes. Or is that going to be, or is Off you go. And if you have better. So, um, <laughs> so, 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 Michael was being horrible to me. <laughs> so, so he's talking about T. Aperitin, T. Macriensis, and T. Regina. Yeah, which I, I remember, these words I remember from something. So they're either a Spinosaur or a tar- Tyrannosaur. Tyrannosaur, t- Tyrannosaurus. And they're Okay, cool. So they've been taken out of the thing and they're probably just a different species and now, and now they, will they be put back in and redefined as their own species? Do you want to ask? Do you want to ask? You, you, you are. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I hurt. <laughs> um, so I won't repeat the question, but in order to rephrase it for the context for anyone who doesn't know, so yes. So a couple of years ago, a guy called Greg Paul with a couple of other people tried to name two new Tyrannosaurus species, Imperator and Regina. As you said, they were thrown out. I was one of the people who threw them back out because it was rubbish. Um, <laughs> to me. All right, it was really rubbish. Um, and then, yeah, more recently, a few months ago, yeah, another paper came out from a different team naming something from, is it New Mexico from, I think it was, um, Tyrannosaurus macraensis. 
So what are the odds that that one will survive and or will the others come back, specifically with anagenesis? And anagenesis is the idea of transformation from one into another. So we normally talk about evolutionary branching. So, you know, the early stories didn't split into the sauropodomorphs and the, and the theropods, for example. But also some things do just change over time. You know, humans are not quite what we were like, you know, a couple of hundred years ago. You might see some distinctive features there, but we haven't split into two new groups. One has just changed into the other. And that's been proposed for a bunch of things recently. So is that what's going on with Regina and Imperator? With regards to Regina and Imperator, no. I mean, that's a fairly easy one because, frankly, the stuff used to try and diagnose those species was not very good. There is a reason a whole bunch of Tyrannosaur experts, not just me, leapt on it and went, God, really? Um, and that, I mean, I, I, I try not to be too catty, but it was bad. Um, and, and obviously bad. Like, it was self-contradictory in places, which is never a good start for defining new species. Um, so I don't think those names might ultimately come back because the very act of trying to name them attaches certain names to certain specimens by default. And something we were very careful to say is we're fine with the idea of more than one Tyrannosaurus species. And people have said this before, and we, none of us were unhappy with that. But if you're going to define a new species, do it properly and make sure that the split is really where you think it is and that there is a clear line so it is perfectly possible that future discoveries or future analyses will one day take a look at the current t-rex stuff and go actually there is probably two different things there and if regina for example sits in one of those piles that is the name that will almost certainly be used because of the way that the naming conventions work so it's at least possible those names will come back but not for any of the reasons that they were named now macraensis was one of those ones where that came out because i i got the heads up because as usual this is the kind of thing she's going to make the media and so several different media people contacted me and said can you take a look at this paper and see what it says and i looked at the paper and god it named another t-rex species <laughs> and then you started reading it going yeah it's probably fair enough actually and i know i wasn't the only one um chatting to some colleagues about it and uh, by the way if you've seen that yeah yeah i've seen it too it's like what do you think mm, it might actually be okay yeah that's what i thought so macraensis looks fairly solid it could definitely have done with a bit more data and a bit more detail on it but i would not be surprised if that lasts long term certainly no one is rushing to try and kill it because they think it's problematic macrensis does look quite distinct to all the other t-rex stuff which is why it's fair enough to name it as something separate what you've probably got with t-rex at the moment which is why i'm happy with the idea that probably are multiple species there is a big smear You've got stuff every, you know, if you plot out skull length or number of teeth or certain proportions or whatever, it, it, it's kind of a big smear. And that's the kind of thing which is you kind of expect for anagenesis and expect, you expect for a lot of things anyway. Over time, stuff changes. If you've got very careful or, or very fine-grained divisions over a couple of million years, you'd expect something to change over time. Um, but that also means it's not usually disjunct. Because it's changing relatively smoothly, you won't find the group with two more teeth and the group with bigger eyes. You'll see two more teeth and then one more tooth or two and one and then one and then one and naught and then slightly bigger eye. And so that there is no clear hard line to, to pull them apart. And so because you've still got that going on, I think if the statistics firm up and we get enough discoveries and you start forming two clusters rather than one smear, again, you, you might draw a line there. But I don't think there's any smear between Macraensis and the T-Rex stuff. So, so, so just, just to everything. clarify this for, like, me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what we're talking about here, we're talking about different species of T-Rex. And we've got... Um, they're all kind of... They're all different, but close enough together that they are together. And there's, we've got this one sample which you're, you're, is different enough. Would it not be a case that if you found one that was different enough next to another one which looked like the old stuff, then you've definitely got two species there? Exclude T. macroensis, which is basic... Which is more or less one skeleton. I think there's a few other bits and bobs from the same place. But you've effectively got one skeleton which is being separated as a separate species, Tyrannosaurus macroensis. Everything else we think is T-Rex. Okay. But everything else that we think is T-Rex covers quite a range of sizes and shapes, probably because it's smeared across a couple of million years and half of North America. Yeah. But that doesn't mean there's more than one species there. Okay. The tigers in India are quite different to the tigers in Siberia. That doesn't mean they're different. Okay. What's your name? Jesse. Jesse. Yes. Um, what's the most recent reptile to go extinct? And are there any reptiles that we 
Jesse wants to know what is the most recent reptile to go extinct and are there reptiles that we thought were extinct which have come back again? You're, you're about 65 million years out of my comfort zone. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I can think of stuff which has been saved from extinction. Yeah. Um, the problem is that defining something as having gone extinct is, oddly enough, tough. Because unless you know it's got a very limited distribution, and then you can check that limited distribution, it's very, very hard. Con- convention says it's, it's defined as extinct when we haven't seen it for 50 years. And even stuff we haven't seen for 50 years has come back subsequently. There was... What was it recently? There was My some. Uncle Jonathan. So, <laughs> no, there was a. Oh, like a pheasant pigeon or something from Malaysia recently, which got caught on a camera trap and hadn't been seen for like 70. Been seen like yeah. once in 70 years, and now we've, we've got definitive footage of it, so it, it's definitely not extinct. There's a Tasmanian creature which apparently has come back, but everybody thinks it's AI generated. So oh, the Tasmanian tiger, yeah. Yeah. Um, but like there's. Um, like the Australian night parrots were thought to be extinct, and then someone found one, and now they're, they're, now we found a dozen different localities. There's thousands of the damn things, um, <laughs> which is which is great, but it's like they really miss these. So yeah, you know, lizards and reptiles generally being small and often being hiding in trees, they're kind of hard. So short version, I'm afraid I really don't know because my modern extinctions I'm not very good at anything that's come back definitively. Not off the top of my head, but one of those problems is just what we haven't catalogued. Oh, Mark Shirts. Actually, we might have had Mark on. I've definitely mentioned it before. Um, so, a colleague of mine um, is now in, working in Denmark and he's doing a lot of stuff in Madagascar on not just lizards and chameleons and the other reptiles, but he's done quite a lot on, on frogs as well. So, I'm, I'm sort of merging frogs in. But him and his team, because he's working with quite a big group of collaborators, they've named something like 50 or 60 new species in about 10 years between them. That's the rate at which they're still finding stuff in Madagascar. So some of that stuff is probably extinct already because if the populations are so rare that that's how hard they are to find in an area we know suffering massive deforestation, massive pollution, massive climate change, it's perfectly possible they found something and it's extinct by the time the paper's out, sadly. But equally, has something come back? Probably, but... You know, the actual number of people working and doing this kind of raw cataloguing and and finding stuff is tragically tiny. And it does make life very, very difficult for this kind of thing. So I would be very surprised if there wasn't something which everyone thought was extinct and has turned up. In fact, I'd expect there to be a whole bunch of them. I'm afraid I can't give you an example off the top of my head. There's just levels of ignorance in front of you. Um, (laughs) Are some of those levels higher than others? (laughs) Yes, then. That that doesn't narrow it down too much, to be honest. They dealt with a problem of how a massive great saurolith leads pigs without them falling down and breaking. I deployed this rather preposterous looking ovipositor. Yes. Is there any evidence at all for that? What's your name, sir? So I can ask. Justin. Justin. Justin wants to know. On a BBC documentary, he saw an ov- ovipositor. Is that how we say it? Yeah. Which is basically a massive tube. Uh, so that sauropods can lay their eggs without breaking them on the floor so they don't tumble too far. What do we think of this, Dave? Is, this, is there um, any truth in that? I mean, so you weren't ever going to find any fossil evidence for it and not without some very unusual preservation. No, uh, it, it's one of those ones... So people have speculated some weird things. There's a beautiful illustration by um, Doug Henderson. This is an absolutely amazing paleo artist um, that he did in probably the mid-'80s of sauropods giving birth to live young. So you've got this dirty, great baby sauropod being dropped out like a giraffe and then breaking out of an amniotic sac. Because this was one of the questions, is to like just how do they get round the problem of laying eggs when you're that kind of size? And that was one proposed solution, uh, though we kind of solved that by finding sauropod eggs with embryos in them um, and never finding sauropod embryos inside adults like we have for like all the marine reptiles. And I, was, I, I just don't think it's necessary. Things like eggs are way more resilient than I think people realize they are and sauropods are mostly laying soft shells so they're much more like lizard eggs or turtle eggs or crocodile eggs which are quite squidgy but also quite crackly but then you know they can deform them really quite badly when they when they are laid and it doesn't really do them any harm so i think if you've dug a soft enough hole and you crouch far enough and then you just dump them they're probably all right and maybe you, maybe the first few do do very badly and just get crushed and only used basically as cushioning for the rest. But again, you know, turtles will do things like this. If if you are, I mean, sauropods, I'm very sure are laying 
dozens and dozens and dozens of eggs at a time because they're absolutely massive and they're laying relatively small eggs. So wasting for free the first 10 when you're laying 150, it doesn't do a lot to your reproductive output. And if it saves the others, it's probably quite a good thing. No to overpositors from me. Um, I, I, I imagine they could probably protrude the cloaca a bit to offset it, but I think they just crouched a lot. Given that some, uh, for some species we have just one fossil. So, uh, most. <laughs> most yeah. so how do we know this is actually a species feature and not just someone who had a weird appearance and was one of or had a mutation or... What's the difference between a freak fossil and a species? Yes. Because um, one weird, weird, you know, deformed creature could just be a weird, deformed creature. Um, it, yeah, so the, the vast majority of dinosaurs, at least, are known from a single specimen. The vast majority, something like 90% of the species, are known from a specimen or a skeleton. How do you know if they're weird or not? Well, of course, on the one hand, you don't. Um, so that's the, that's the really short answer is you don't. Without a population, you do not know what degrees of variation are like or what is unusual, even for things like you know, male versus female. On the other hand, you know, big mutations that cause major changes, A, don't usually survive in infanthood anyway, and B, are very, very rare in the population. So we would be profoundly unlucky... If we dug up a species, if we dug up a specimen and it was a one in a million or one in a billion animals that had a bunch of weird features and survived to adulthood and then we found it and then we thought it was a new species. That could happen, but I don't think it would really affect anything we do very much. It would be a constant outlier and mess up at the kind of fringes of things. But the idea that our fundamental understanding of dinosaur ecology would be wrong because we think there are two species there when there was one, or our understanding of how the evolution trajectory of this clade went, because that one extra animal shouldn't be there. It, it's never really going to have anything like that kind of effect. So they, they probably don't ever really turn up. If they do, at least some of them we would probably recognise, because there are some very consistent genetic errors that produce certain features, and that would be true of humans as it is reptiles. So we, we just see it and go, hang on, it looks like it's got... But it's in theory an issue, but in, in practice, it's, it's basically an irrelevance. And as I say, they, they, they probably don't survive, you know, macro errors like the, the, the kind that produce really big things like that don't, don't usually hang around. What's your favourite weird feature? <laughs> <laughs> so what is your favourite weird feature? Do not look at me, don't. That, 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 that I found or that I know about? I was going to say, because I, I haven't found many, because <laughs> I don't usually go digging. There's a good question, actually. Um, I do really like alvarosaur hands and alvarosaur arms. So we, we have mentioned them before. So these are tiny little things. They are the smallest dinosaurs are adult that outside of birds. Chicken-sized or even smaller, crow-sized. And then their arms are... So they've got a big shoulder and they've got a really big, solid, muscly, humerus upper arm and lower arm. And then the wrist has turned into just a single, giant, solid block of bone with then one giant claw stuck on the end of it. Yeah, I, I know you're miming. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying very boring technical things and everyone's giggling and the recording for this is going to be very curious That's unless fine. I point out that you're doing miming I'm, being I'm an doing, alvarosaur. I'm um, doing, don't get hugged by an alvarosaur. Yeah, so they, they, have, they have all these features which we classically associate with digging, specifically a form of digging called scratch digging or hook and pull digging. So hook and pull specifically, which is what you get in things like Anteaters, aardvarks, armadillos, um, pangolins, and anything that's breaking into tough stuff, um, which is one of the reasons we think that they're doing that. Except their arms are absolutely tiny, so they're they're, they're absolutely enormous in like Arnold Schwarzenegger like build of really really giant solid bones with these extra protrusions to make these giant levers on them to make them even stronger and even more effective whilst being absolutely tiny and it's just weird the proportions because even on a very small animal like this if you're really going down that route you'd expect it to have bigger arms i mean it doesn't really it, it is weird because you do have yeah things like you know pangolins are a pretty good example because they're capable of being bipedal so they do they do walk along on their back legs so it hasn't really bothered them having relatively big, strong arms. I don't know why albatross just don't have bigger arms to do this more effectively. I think... But yeah, they've got the most muscly arms on the smallest possible thing. Could it be... And uh, he's going to say no because they lived in the desert. But limpets, right? They can use them to pull off limpets. Do you, do you know where they lived? Desert, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. 
desert limpets. We just need to find them. That would be... Uh, pangolins are brilliant, by the way. It, it, for people who might not know what a pangolin is, anybody in this room does, but people listening might not, look up a mammal with, like, like its fur has become uh, scales, basically, yeah, on its back. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's a type of... It's a, it's a bit like an armadillo, but it's not like an armadillo. They're, an they're in their own branch. Yeah. And, and you get them in places like Sahara in Africa. Or not Sahara, but... Sub-Sahara. Uh, Sub-Sub-Sub- Sub-Sub- and then yeah. they're, they're through in Indonesia and into, and into India. So and they're this. gorgeous. And because they've got such... Cause they're, they look um, like living pine cones, basically. They do look like living pine cones. And they, but the way that they move, because they walk bipedally, they sort of tuck their forearms up like this, and they, but they can't stand up straight, so they sort of go along and they look like going, yes, my liege. <laughs> and they're lovely animals. And I, I like them a lot, pangolins. Sorry, I got excited by pangolins. What's your name, sir? Jamie. Jamie. Going off of that, do we have any evidence of powerful long arms that might suggest burrowing after prey or burrowing the nest? So Jimmy wants to know about powerful long arms because you know he's inspired by us. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, can I can I just say? Because um, <laughs> they do have powerful. Yeah, long arms. not really. Um, long. So they're long. Yes, is the short answer. Um, so I I have suggested in a paper with my colleague Tom Holt the spinosaurs might actually be doing this mm. because if you look at the spinosaurs are very badly preserved they're an absolute bin fire in that regard but if you look at Sukumaima so this is the big one from Niger from uh, from Central Africa gets to like 10 10ish meters we've got a decent set of four limbs for Sukumaima and Sukumaima has a lot of the same things that I've just described in alvarosaurs and all these hook and pull diggers they've got this weird expansion on the head of the humerus which is really good for attraction they've actually got quite a long extension on the ulna one of the forearm bones which pushes backwards which then gives you a lever to pull and they've got giant fingers with giant claws on them so i don't think spinosaurs are burrowing just to be clear but sucomimus at least has a forelimb which is really well suited to basically pulling back towards its own chest with a giant claw. And that's what all these hook and pull diggers do. And so I can totally imagine, well, that's what we basically suggested, that this was part of their behavioral repertoire. And when you think about, you know, I I think these are basically weird crocodile-like generalists. Uh, You know, they're definitely eating a whole bunch of fish, but they're doing other things too, just like all the crocs do. Even the fish specialists like gharials and tomastoma, will take larger prey when they can. Um, and I can totally imagine that, you know, that lots of things are really good at burrowing into sandbanks. Snakes, turtles, various lizards, crocodiles, all of these things will burrow into the bank or, or into mud if they can. And so something that can basically just claw that out and eat them, probably really quite a good adaptation. So yeah, I think spinosaurs have very long, strong arms that they could probably dig with. They're not specialised for it but they definitely have the right set of adaptations. Q loads of papers showing that they go diving underwater and yeah. <laughs> pulling them up from the... <laughs> um, we won't get into spine salt hunting. Because... No. Um, I mean, there's some other stuff that's supposed to be digging, uh, so Thescolosaurs and a thing called Erictodromius, which are these, let's be honest, fairly boring-looking ornithisians in that they don't have the spikes or armour or head crest or any of the other exciting things that all the other ornithisians have. Um, but Eryptodromius in particular is supposed to be a bit of a burrower. I think it probably is. So I was having a discussion with a guy called David Button about this at the Natural History Museum in January, because uh, David's done some work on this as well, and we're, I think we're in broad agreement that Eryptodromius, because it's been described as a burrowing dinosaur, and I think it kind of is, but it's nothing like as specialised as I think some people have, have thought it is. So I think it's a burrower in the way that a rabbit is. So rabbits are really actually pretty good at digging a small circular tunnel that a a rabbit can get into. But actually, if you look at the adaptations that are there in the skeleton, that there's not a lot. But rabbits are specialist runners. They're not specialist diggers. They're quite good at digging for a runner. Whereas when I say about something that's burrowing, I'm thinking of something like a mole or a mole rat or a um, prairie dog or something like that, where you now see very clear deep adaptations in the skeleton to, to, to do that. So I think Erectodromius is certainly capable of digging the burrows in which we have found it, but the suggestion that it's a burrower, and this is, I know it's getting into semantics almost, but 
I have seen people now interpret this as, oh, they're digging these great big long warrens because they're burrowers. And it's like, no, it's better at digging than other dinosaurs. That doesn't necessarily mean it's really good at digging. I'm going to let you know, guys, if your bottoms are sore, we've got like 10 minutes left. Oh, God, have we? Yeah. Look at you go <laughs> thinking, thinking we wouldn't be able to cover this. I mean, that's what you do. said. <laughs> I did. Well, I, 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 I said, I I'm going for ages. You said we'd run I imagine a load of questions going, who would win in a fight? And you just going, no. That's. <laughs> So, um, uh, stick up your Don't hands, really, ideas. really tall. Yeah, okay, so yeah, who would win in a fight as now I'm going to go all the way to the back row with man in red. Thank you. Um, I'm a teacher. If you were going to pick one dinosaur from each group to describe it as a, as a group, so sauropods, what would be the dinosaur you would pick as a typical sauropod to describe? What would, what, what's the most? Uh, so we got. A what's the sauropodiest sauropod? We've got Sir at the back. What's the most? What's the most sauropodiest sauropod? Theropodiest said if theropod. Hadrosaurus, hadrosaur. Yeah, so, so a sauropod actually probably uh, probably Camarasaurus, which not many people will be familiar with because it just never gets the attention that it should. But something like half the fossils of the Morrison Formation, so which gave us Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus and Apatosaurus and so many other famous ones. Half of them are Camarasaurus. This is by far the most common thing there. And it's got a long neck and a long tail and a big body, but its neck's not that long and its tail's not that long and it's not that big, but it's not that small and it doesn't have a really weird head. So it is really a very, very average sauropod in in that regard. So I think that's actually a a pretty good emblematic one. For theropods, um, so for my next book, I had to do that because you need to, you know, we, we can afford a few drawings like what's your what's your emblematic theropod like, mm-hmm. um, but I went for Allosaurus and I think that's about as close um, it does have a few things that are a bit you know it's pretty big it's bigger than most um, it has got its head crests but they're not too exaggerated and lots of theropods have head crests but its arms are big but not that big its head's big but not that big it's got a lot of teeth but not that many or too few so that's that's pretty median and run of the mill the ornithistines is much harder because you're never going to get something that captures a hadrosaur and an ankylosaur and a ceratopsian. They're just so madly different from each other. But probably something like Iguanodon, because it's quite general in a lot of ways, but it's much, much harder for them. But I, I think that's probably about as close as you could get to something generic. Okay, uh, let's go back to you, yes. Um, I was just going to ask you... So- <laughs> what a waste of a question this is! <laughs> yeah. After four years of this podcast, you know, what's been your real wow moment? Or you know, We're still going after four years. We are still be. going after four years. It's probably the biggest wow moment. Um, it, you it, didn't repeat the question. I d- okay, so what, why, what have I learned after four years? Um, that in a fight, T Rex would win against a Spinosaurus. There we go. That's the most annoying thing I could. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is now. We, we're literally now running over. So thank you so much for coming out supporting us. It really does. You know, it's a, it's a big deal for us, isn't it? Dan? Yes. Yes. Yes, it yeah. is. I'm, I'm amazed it happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, obviously, um, do still continue to listen. You can hear your own voices in the background on this recording, hopefully on Wednesday. So if anything you want to revise and go, oh, I forgot that, it will be in that recording on Wednesday. Um, thank you so much for coming. And it's been an absolute pleasure. And this has been Terrible Lizards. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Terrible Lizards. You are amazing. If you're a patron, you're double amazing. You can support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards or just go to terriblelizards.co.uk and follow the links. If a bunch of extra content and having your questions answered doesn't appeal, you can always support the show by leaving us a review. Please do share it with your friends. It does make a massive difference. And if you want to support either Dave or myself individually, please go to our prospective websites, davehome.co.uk or iszizzy.com. You can get our books. Mine have got nothing to do with dinosaurs. But anyway, squawky bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>